for that. Go ahead and grab your seat if you would and find in your Bibles the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. You'll get there. Start at the left, work your way to the right, and you will get to 1 Samuel and then go to chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. We're looking today, I told you we're beginning a new series of messages called Heroes. People that God used for some extraordinary things. And I I wish we had the time to um, focus so much on every person. You know, the life of David, this could, David, a man after God's own heart, this could, David alone could be a 10-week sermon series, easily looking from the very beginning to the end of David's life. Um, but we, we, I don't want to do that. I want to focus in on like a pivotal moment in their life, a moment when they could have not followed the Lord or they could chose to follow the Lord. Um, We're going to look at those pivotal moments in the lives of some of these great heroes in the Bible. Today we're looking at David and part of God's timing plan for David involved placing a young man, David, in some very, very difficult situations. In those difficult times, David learned the valuable lesson of trusting the Lord. You know, it's, have you ever noticed in your own life it's really easy to trust the Lord when everything's going well? It, you know, I mean, your income's up, your blood pressure's down, everything's just going great. It's easy to trust the Lord during those good times. When things get bumpy, when things go south, when things take an unexpected turn, you get a report from a doctor, you get a word from your employer, you get some unexpected news that just flips your life upside down like that, well then that's what we call where the rubber meets the road. It's tough sometimes to trust in the Lord during those times, but what we're going to find is that all of these heroes had those times. They all had those moments, those times when things really could have gone badly for them. Something terrible was about to happen and they just had to lean on the everlasting arms of God and trust God and have faith in the Lord. David learned the lessons necessary not only to survive life, but to thrive throughout his life. We see David in one of the most desperate times, I believe, in his life to date in our passage today. So I want us to look now at 1 Samuel chapter number 17. We're going to drop down to verse number 32. And Saul, or then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now let's stop right there. We've got to set the stage for this, don't we? Young David has gotten word that the armies of Israel have gathered on the hillside, but there is something that is keeping them at bay. And it was a man whom the Bible calls a giant. Now, I don't know how big you have to be for people to call you a giant. I'm pretty tall. I'm a pretty big guy. But nobody except maybe my little granddaughter, Georgia, calls me a giant, okay? Uh, And I, listen, you know what? I was at an NBA basketball game one time and I got to shake the hand of a Chinese basketball player named Yao Ming. Yao Ming is about seven feet tall. He is seven feet tall. I looked at this man, I felt like Georgia, my little granddaughter, looking up at him because I was looking at him like this. And man, I'm telling you, his hand was like this compared to mine. This is a, you know, this is a tall guy. But, you know, in the NBA, there's a lot of tall guys. There's a lot of guys, Shaquille O'Neal and and LeBron James, they're all really tall guys with really big hands and really long feet. But I never looked at them and thought, man, those are all giants. Okay, so now perspective is everything, right? 
but I've met a seven foot tall guy. I didn't consider him a giant. So I don't know how big you have to be for people to say there's a giant down there. But that's what the Bible calls him, Goliath. Even the name Goliath means huge. They called him a giant. There's a giant down there, and he is mocking not only the people of God, but he's mocking God himself. He's challenging any of God's people to come out, and he would handedly kill anyone that came. That sets the stage. David goes to King Saul. David says, hey, look, what's going on here? Verse 32, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, meaning David, the little shepherd boy, David, David, the runty little kid, the teenager. He said, I'll go fight him. I'll go out. Don't let anyone hearts get trouble. Because I'll go. I'll, I'll take him. Can you imagine how King Saul had to, if he didn't do it out loud, inside he's certainly laughing, okay? I mean, this is a giant. Even some of his top fighters were beginning to shake a little bit. Nobody wanted to fight the giant. They knew what he was capable of. They could hear it in his voice. He was so confident about this. Look at the next verse, verse 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth. You're just a teenager. And he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from the mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now that's frightening. That's frightening. He's like, look, son, if you've got a death wish, God bless you. Go ahead and have your fun. You go do what you think you need to do. And I, I'm sure if this were an MMA event, HBO would have been there filming the whole thing. I mean, this is going to be a bloodbath. Every, everybody knows it. Everybody, including Saul, knows it. Everyone that is, except David. Except David. Verse 38, so here's what Saul did, King Saul. He clothed David in his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, and he had not tested them. And David said, Saul, I can't walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took all of it off. Do you see the picture? Have you ever seen a kid playing dress up before? Have you seen that? We've all done that. I mean, my mom still to this day has a little chest in one of her extra bedrooms, and it has dress-up clothes. And the little kids go in there, and they put on shirts that are this much too long and T-shirts that hang down past their knees, and they'll put on like a little hat and maybe a little boa around their neck, and they come out like they're movie stars, and they pretend to be something they're not. That's what David looked like. David looked like he was wearing his daddy's clothes. I mean, he had all this stuff on this helmet that probably came down to here and the, the sword that probably drugged the ground behind him. He had all this stuff on that just didn't fit. And when he walked, it was kind of like he was dragging everything behind him. He could not move with all of this stuff on. So David's like, look, we haven't tried any of this and this doesn't really fit me. I got it, and he just starts taking all of it off. And I'm thinking, Saul in his mind is thinking, you know what? You didn't have any chance with a helmet on. You certainly don't have any chance without it. You know, you're taking anything that could have defended you or protected you, you're taking all of that off, and you're going out there just like a teenage runt, and you're going to face Goliath the champion 
of the Philistines. This is not going to go well. We've all seen how this kind of thing goes. Verse number 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. What an epic buildup this is. I mean, they've set the stage now, haven't they? They have given you all of the things you need to begin this story to know this is not going to go well. I mean, they've just told you everything in your mind. You can think, oh, this poor kid, he's just going out. He's doomed. But here goes David with a little staff in his hand, a sling around his other hand, just like he had done so many times before, protecting his father's sheep on the, on the countryside. And he's going out to the valley of Elah to face what in Bible terms was a man that was nine feet, nine inches tall. I would call that a giant. I'm a pretty big guy. I'd call that a giant. And I think when you see someone of that size, that size, I can't even reach nine feet. The tip of my finger, if I stand in such a way, the tip of my finger will touch an eight-foot ceiling. So go up one more foot higher than the tip of my finger, and you've got a soldier there who by all rights is a killing machine. And he sees from the armies of God a teenage boy coming without even a sword in his hand. David is in for the battle of his life. David is, has accepted a challenge that even King Saul himself wouldn't accept. Here's some things we need to learn from this story as we continue in this story. Number one, we must learn to trust in God's timing. We must learn to trust in God's timing. If you look going back into verse number 17 and up to about 24, we see that the day began for David just like any other day that he had ever had before. His plans were to tend to the sheep, to do the same things that he had done day in and day out, really every day of his life up to this point. But this day is going to be different. Jesse, his father, sends David to check on David's three elder brothers who are now fighting in the armies for King Saul. They've been gone now, according to chapter 17 and verse number 16, they've already been gone for 40 days. They haven't heard any word from them yet. So Jesse doesn't know, are my sons dead? Are they still alive? David you go find out. Just go and find out somehow what their status is. How are they doing? Are they still alive? You see, in those days, countries didn't have standing armies like our country has a standing army. We have vocational men and women who serve, that draw a paycheck from the government. They are ready to fight on a moment's notice. They are a standing army. Now, in the event that the standing army isn't enough, we still have something available called a draft. And a draft simply means that if you're young enough and you're able body, if the standing army isn't, doesn't have enough people to do what they need to do, then they send out message to all able body young men and women saying, come right now, you're being called up by the president, the commander-in-chief, to fight. You don't get to debate that. Your response is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be, yes, sir. I'll be there. That's your answer. Yes, sir. And you go. 
Now, back in this day, they didn't have standing armies. They had maybe a militia that guarded the palace and things like that, but they certainly didn't have hundreds of thousands of soldiers that were always on standby. So whenever a battle was to come up, the king would send word out to the countryside that all able-bodied men would report immediately to the front lines and they would be ready to fight. These weren't trained soldiers. These were farmers. They were workers. They were laborers. They were butchers and bread makers. They were just people like you and me, just regular people that were called up by their king and they went to fight and defend the Lord's land. He called for them and demanded they show up ready to fight. So David goes to his brothers as he's commanded to do by his dad. And when he arrives, he finds the armies of Israel cowering in fear because of Goliath. Even King Saul, a tested soldier, even King Saul was too afraid to face this giant in battle. But while the army of Saul hides in their tents, David hears the giant as he blasphemes the name of God Almighty and shames the people of God. And and in David's day, even though it started like every other day before it, Before the sun goes down, David would find himself face to face and toe to toe with one of the greatest soldiers that had ever lived. An epic day, an epic saga is playing out. Now let let me, without stretching this point too much, let me just say this. Giants come in all shapes and sizes. We're reading a story today about an actual person, a physical being, a real person, and a real David who fought this real person on real dirt, on a real battleground, on a real day. But giants come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes you're going about your everyday life, just like every other day before it. You you, you get up, you have a cup of coffee, maybe eat some breakfast, you go to work, you work all day, you come home, you fix dinner, you talk to the kids, you help them with homework, then you go to bed, you get up and you do it the next day, just like that day. But then something happens, something happens that makes that day unlike any other day that came before it. And it changes everything. A giant can crop up like that from nowhere. Some of you have experienced that. I've experienced that in my own life. Some of you have experienced that. You get that result from the doctor. It changes everything. It makes that day different than any other day you ever had before it. Maybe something else happens. Maybe you're just going home from work and something happens and and it changes everything. Maybe you've never been in a car wreck before, but now you're in a car wreck. It changes everything. Giants come in all shapes and sizes. What we learn from the life of King, not yet King David, but what we learn from this young shepherd boy named David is that God's timing is everything. We need to trust in the timing of God, that God knows what's going on before it even happens, and that God is in control. So we're going to learn this, and we're going to apply these principles into our day-to-day lives, because suffice to say, you will probably never face a nine-foot, nine-inch physical man. You're never going to face Goliath, a soldier, But that doesn't mean you might not have a Goliath crop up in your life that you never expected to face. If we're going to survive in giant territory, we need to understand that giants don't just show up, their appearance is well-timed. Now, from our perspective, they just show up. It's like I wasn't expecting that, but I got that. Now I've got to deal with that. Sometimes from our earthly perspective, they just pop up. But from God's perspective, they don't just pop up. God's timing is involved in every part of our life. Sometimes these things show up, but from God's perspective, they are all part of his plan for our life. I truly wish all of us would grasp the biblical truth that nothing 
nothing comes our way apart from the will of God. Nothing, nothing comes our way apart from the will of God. If we did, it would change our attitude about everything when the giants show up. It would change everything. Our whole perspective would change if we just understood that biblical truth that nothing happens to you apart or outside of the will of God. Most of the time, I fear that we're just like Israel. They wandered through the wilderness for for years after they left Egypt and they had arrived at, the, arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, all they had to do was cross the river and take the promised land. And they would get all the blessings that God had promised to them just on the other side. But instead of going to take the land, what do they do? They sent spies. What did the spies say? There's giants there. Oh, the biblical theme of giants keeps cropping up, doesn't it? There's giants in the land and they're carrying food that it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. We can't possibly go and take that. But you know, here's the deal. God never said go scout the land. God said go take the land. God didn't say send spies. He said get over the river and go. He didn't say, go check it out for yourself and verify what I said. That's not what God told him. God said, go. Just go. Go. Trust me, because my ti- in my timing, I have you at the Jordan River, on the banks of it, at exactly the right moment in time that I ordained for you to be there, and I've got everything under control. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe God. They just simply didn't believe. And that's a bad place to be when you don't believe what God has already said. Here's the point of it all. Did God know about the giants? Nod your head this way. It's no trick questions here. Did did God know about the giants? Did God have a plan? Did they know his plan? Should they have trusted him anyway? You see see how simple this test is? It's not like algebra. Okay, I'm not making you memorize a quadratic equation. Okay, these are simple questions. Did God know? Yes. Did they understand? No. Did God have a plan? Yes. Should they have listened to God? Uh Uh-huh. But they didn't. Now, take that fast forward. We're at the Valley of Elah. Here's a little ruddy shepherd boy going to face a giant by anyone's account, a brutal, savage, killing machine. And all David says is, let me get my hands on him. (laughs) Let me get my hands on him. He doesn't stand a chance. Now, he gets an A for effort. He gets an A for a positive attitude. We'll give him that. But if you were just reading this story without knowing how the story ends, oh my, you would have thought this poor kid, this is the last we ever see of David. It's been nice. You were a good shepherd. I hope your dad has backup plan. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When a giant shows up in your life, it is not by accident. When a giant shows up in your life, it is through the providence of God. That means God has a plan. God knew about it. God has ordained it or God has allowed it. So you don't need to fear it. It is there because God either sent it your way or God allowed it to come your way. But either way, God is in control. And in his precise timing, you need to face whatever has come in front of you. When giants come, we can get depressed, or we can become defeated, 
Or we can realize that they are just a a tangible symbol of God working out his will in our lives. We can, like Saul and Israel, we can try to hide from the giant. We can cower inside of our tents. We can go inside of our home and not come out. We can be scared like little school children. We can hide out and not show our face. We can be discouraged We can do like Job did and worship in spite of the giants, what they're doing in our lives. The choice is yours. You get to decide how you respond. But if we can ever understand that giants come according to God's timing, it will help us survive and thrive when they call us out. Survival is a matter of timing. Number two, We must learn to trust in God's plan. Did you hear that? You've got to learn to trust in God's plan. If you look back in verses 25 through where we stopped in verse 40, what you find is that when David hears the threats and defiance of Goliath, he determines that something has to be done to this giant. Something welled up inside of him like how dare you talk about my God that way? How dare you talk about the people of God that way? Who do you think you are? In all fairness, I think when David was standing up on the hillside, the giant looked about this big. Perspective is everything, right? Every step you get closer, he gets bigger and bigger and bigger until he's nine feet, nine inches tall. Everything changes with perspective. But David is unwavering. David walks out with complete confidence, unwavering in his indignation toward this giant. David has something welling up inside of him that says, how dare you? Who do you think you are? You are a pagan. How dare you talk about the one true and living God that way? How dare you? David sets out to see that Goliath is defeated. But as soon as David expresses his desire um, to see that the giant is defeated, he's met with criticism. Look at verse number 28. Back up to verse number 28. Now Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insol- and the insolence in your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. He said, you're just a nosy little brother. We're out here fighting a battle, and you're just the nosy little brother. By the way, who's watching the sheep? You hear it in their voice? Even his own brothers are angry that David would show up, not to mention open his mouth. You know, there have been times, I've seen it in the movies, and so have you, when a big brother is facing someone that's even bigger than him, but the little brother thinks nobody can beat up my big brother, and the little brother's standing there saying, yeah, but he's going to whip you. He's my big brother. He's going to whip you, and your big brother's like, if you don't shut up, I'm going to kill you. Just shut your mouth, or this is is how you die. You should be having a near-death experience right now, and you don't even know it. I think the older brothers are like, oh, my goodness, If the king hears this, he's going to send me out to face the giant because my little brother won't shut up. So he yells at his little brother. This is not nice. He's not having a conversation, you understand. He's yelling at his little brother. Be quiet or I'm going to handle you. David's unwavering. David is trusting God's plan. He had criticism. He also faced doubt. Even King Saul said, young boy, come on now. Even your brothers, 
the army of God, nobody wants to face this man. We're trying to formulate a plan. David's like, we don't need a plan. Just send me out. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Again, he gets an A for effort. He gets an A for his attitude. But my goodness, everybody around him is saying, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And we watch David move toward the moment when he will face off with the giant as we see a young man who has learned something about faith and he's learned to trust in the Lord. So we have, to, we have to trust in God's timing and we have to trust in God's plan for our life. Now David is learning a lot about the plans of the Lord. Um, first of all, David learned about God's purposes, that God has a purpose in everything that happens. In 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and down in verse number 13, David has already been anointed as king of Israel. Now listen. God has already told David, you are going to be king of Israel. He's already been anointed as king of Israel. David knew based on that knowledge, either A, God lied to me, or B, this is not the day I die because I'm still a shepherd, I'm not king yet. God has told him, God spoke to him, you will be king of Israel. And with that knowledge, that knowledge gave David a sense of boldness because he knows I might get beat up a little bit, but I'm not dying here. God told me I'm going to be king. And unless that happens in the next 30 minutes, I'm heading out. I'm going to go fight. I'm going to go to pick up the challenge that nobody else will take. I know this isn't my day to die. David also knew something about God's protection, didn't he? Remember what we read, verses 34 through 37. David says, hey, when I was a shepherd, I would have lions that came and tried to take one of the lambs. And if they did, I'd grab them by the beard and I'd get that lamb back. And if they came against me, I'd kill it. If a bear came, I'd kill the bear. I face down lions and I face down bears. Just turn me loose on this giant. I'll make short work of him too. David has learned something about the protection of God. David not only trusts God, but David knows God will protect me. You stand up in church, you say, man, if God be for you, who can be against you? And everybody says, amen, hallelujah, until their giant shows up. Until their giant comes face to face with them, then they, get, they start second guessing that. But David has learned. David said, look, I face lions. I face bears. I faced a lot of terrifying things, but God protected me. God took care of me. God watched over me. God made a way for me to do that. And through that, David also learned something about God's power. If you look at verses 38 through 40, what we looked at, David knew that victory will not reside in swords and shields and spears and armor and all the other things that they tried to stack up on top of this little teenage boy. He knew that victory was coming in the name of the Most High God. He knew God would have a victory, not swords and spears and all that kind of stuff. His battle was not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers in heavenly places. David's trust was not in the army, the armor or the armaments of war, David's trust was squarely on Almighty God. David trusted God. I hope you're trusting God today. I mean, I really believe, I, I hope, I hope you are just trusting God today. No matter what's in front of you, no matter what you're facing, I hope that you've learned to just trust in God and, and trust the Lord through the whatever time you found yourself in. I hope you're in a good time right now. Trust in the Lord through that. 
But if you're in a bad place at a bad time, trust in the Lord. Here's what you need to know. God did not save you for some old giant to destroy you. That's not why God saved you, so that you could be destroyed by an unknown giant. God saved you to take you home to glory someday. The giant cannot, listen, giants, no matter how big they are, can never undo the eternal work of God. They can't do it. They don't have that kind of power over our lives. The giant is there as part of God's eternal plan for your life. The giant is there to help you grow in your faith in the Lord. Secondly, God will not change courses in midstream. Oh, maybe I gave him the giant too soon. Here, come on, it's okay. Let's go over here. I'll give you an easy path. I'll, I'll, it's okay. You go this way. Go, go where it's all nice and smooth and you can just go, just go that way. That's okay. You gave it your best, your best shot. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. God's not going to change midstream. If God puts you in front of a giant, it's time to fight. It's time to stand your ground. What, what um, Paul said in Ephesians, just stand firm. Stand firm, plant your feet, I will not move, I will not waver, I will not cower back, I will not back up, shut up, I'm going to stand right here, so help me God, I will not be moved, and stand your ground. Because when you stand like that, you're standing on holy ground. God, it's as though God puts a circle around you and you cannot be moved if God told you to stand. Stand firm. Stand firm. Don't waver. Trust in God's timing. Trust in God's plans. Listen, the God who brought you there wherever you are today, is the same God that took David to face Goliath. God hasn't changed, and the same God that's going to deliver him can deliver you also. Do you know how I know that? Because in Malachi chapter number 3 and verse number 6, God declares this. He says, I am the Lord. I changeth not. God hasn't changed. The same God that took that ruddy little teenage boy, David, to face one of the greatest warriors the world had ever known is the same God who's standing by you today. Do you believe that? If you believe that, say amen. If you don't believe that, just say, oh my, because you're in deep trouble. God is standing with David. God is standing with him. He can't possibly lose. David has learned to trust the Lord. He's learned a lot about the purposes of God as a shepherd. He learned a lot about the protection of God as a shepherd. He's learned about the power of God as a shepherd. But now he's going to face off with a giant. In his heart, David knows full well that God will never fail those who put their trust in him. Let me say that again. You need to hear that today. God will never fail those who place their trust in him. Those who trust men and methods and materials can and will fail. But those who place their unwavering trust in the Lord and his power will never fail. You see, our God is not a weak, anemic God. He is a God of might, and he's a God of unlimited, unmeasurable power. And he's able to do anything he sets his purposes to do. And that means even protecting you. 
Those who trust in him can face giant, the giants of life and they can see the power of God work and deliver them through whatever's in front of them. We must trust in God's timing. We have to trust in God's plan. Thirdly, we must trust in God's faithfulness. Look at verse, starting with verse number 41. Drop down there. Verse number 41 through, um, we'll go through several verses. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for his only, he's only a youth, a ruddy and good looking young man. <laughs> Isn't that funny that that would be in there? He is a ruddy but good looking young man. Verse 40 So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give you your I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Woo! David's in a mood right now, isn't he? I mean, man, can you see this little punk kid? His chest is out. He's welled up. He's got his finger pointing upward like this, nine feet in the air. And he is ready to fight the entire army of the Philistines. He's ready. He's shaking that finger. He's given him everything he's got verbally. Verse number 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you. And if that weren't good enough, I'm going to take your head off of you. Now, in the world of UFC, we call that trash talk right? <laughs> These guys, it's like they're forehead to forehead and they're looking at each other, giving each other that look. They, they're snarling. They're talking under their breath to one another. They're just trash talking one another. David said, not only, not only am I going to take you down, I'm going to take your head. I bet his brothers are like, oh my Lord. Oh, my Lord, Lord, please. He's just a dumb teenager. <laughs> spare his life. Let him maim him a little bit and beat the daylights out of him, but spare his life, Lord. I can just see him having their little prayer meeting over to the side. And if that weren't enough, I'm going to take your head. He said, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth. And all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. The whole world's going to hear this day that our God reigns. Verse 47 and all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Can you imagine this battle, this epic battle that's getting ready to wage? Here is a giant. This guy, boom, 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 as he ran. You could hear the ground shake, and he's picked up his sword, and he's ready to fight. And here's David, a little bit teenager, going, Woo! here we go. Let's get it on. I'm ready. He is running toward the giant. Toward the giant. My heart is just, what is this kid doing? 
What in the world could he possibly be doing? And David put his hand, verse number 49, and David put his hand into his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it as he's running, throws it at the job. A stone, a little stone, throws it, slings it at the giant and it struck the Philistine right in the forehead. So that stone sank into his forehead. Did you hear that? It didn't just hit him and get his attention. It hit him and went right through his skull and sank into his forehead and he fell with his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. So but therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. The Bible is pretty graphic, isn't it? David did exactly what he said he was going to do. David didn't need a sword He didn't need a big heavy helmet. David didn't need a a javelin. He didn't need a battle axe. He didn't need a hammer. He didn't need any of that stuff. All he needed was God. All he needed was God. Friends, there is a time when trash talk needs to stop and action needs to begin. David understood that. He said, we can yell back at one another, but I'm fixing to take you down. There's no question in my mind about how that's going to happen either. I'm going to take you down, and you're going to lose your head today right here in front of everybody. We talk about God providing for us, but we still worry over our finances We talk about God watching over us, but we cower at a test result written on paper. We believe in God's protection until it becomes personal. We believe in the sovereignty of God until things don't go according to our plans. We believe in the protection and the care of God until something happens in our own life that brings it all to question. And if we're not careful, instead of charging forward, we could retreat backward. David defeated Goliath, a giant, a real giant that day, Because he was willing to trust in the faithfulness of his God. He knew that God would never let him down. He knew that that was not even in the realm of possibility. And friends, as we face giants in our own lives, we have already been promised a victory as well. How? By doing what David did. Place your trust in the Lord. Believe that God can do everything that God ever did. Did you hear that? Believe that God today can do anything God has ever done. Same God, he doesn't change. Place your trust in the Lord. Believe that God can do anything that God's ever done before. Then walk down into the valley and square off with your giant and keep on slinging until he falls. And God will be glorified. God will be praised. God will be exalted because no one in the crowd ever believed that it was the little pebble that took down the giant. They knew it was God who did it. 
pebbles don't kill giants, God does. Friend, whether you know it or not, whether you are young or old or somewhere in between, you are a giant slayer. God has put that inside of your heart. You are a giant slayer. You're a giant killer. Not because you possess any power, but because you serve a God who is infinitely powerful. Not because your aim is good, but because God never misses. And it's not because you deserve anything at all from God, but because he has promised to give you the victory in this world through Jesus, his only son. So we need to get out there and live our lives according to the faithfulness of God, don't we? Amen? We need to get out there and live our lives according to the faithfulness of God, trusting the Lord. Just like Zechariah said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Don't stop, just stop trying to do it in your own power with your own hands. Get on your knees and trust God. Trust the Lord to deliver whatever giant he's put in front of you. Believe that God will. Believe that God can. Trust God to do it. Trust in the spirit of God that's inside of you. David is one of my heroes because David learned to live his life according to faith. He had faith in the Lord. Are you trusting are you trusting the Lord today? Are you genuinely trusting the Lord? Are you ready to fight whatever giant is there in front of you? Are you ready to take it on? Are you ready to go for it and unwaveringly just be undeterred knowing that you're going to win because God said so? Are you ready? You ready to face those giants today? I hope you are. Because I'm telling you, if David can take a little shepherd boy off a hillside and have him not only defeat a giant, but later lead an entire nation, then there's no telling what God can do with you. There's no telling how God can use you. There's no telling where God can take you if only you trust him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is a wonderful, wonderful historical account of a young boy who was put into a very tough circumstance and had to lean on you without wavering. Help us to learn, help us to trust you like David. Help us, Lord, to have faith like David. Help us to lean on you like David. Give us the courage of David. Give us the indignation of David. Give us the boldness of David as we trust you and follow you. Lord, if, there, if there's anyone here today that has not yet trusted you as their God, as their Lord, their Savior from sin, I pray they will today. That will be the first step of having a life of victory today. Lord, there may be some here that are, are ready to join our church family. And I pray that they would just come today. They would come and today would be the day that they will just join and become part of our church family and begin living that life of victory today. God bless them as they come. We love you, Lord. We follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up with me right now? As our music begins.